All right, thanks everybody for coming today. Um, we're really excited to be working with uh, Barry and Council on this economic research project, uh, looking at technology jobs all over the country. Um, so a little background on Engine for everybody. Uh, we're a coalition of startups, entrepreneurs, investors, and other innovators who are interested in connecting policymakers and entrepreneurs. Um, this is an image captured from our last startup, Dan the Hill. Um, actually, you can probably see Ty out in the space right now, but he's a uh, an entrepreneur meeting with uh, Senator Jerry Moran during our last sort of day in the Hill. Um, we really endeavor to make those conversations happen between policymakers and startups. And one of the things that we're really focused on is empowering those entrepreneurs with uh, great data uh, and important findings to sort of drive the conversations uh, that will make policy smarter for people throughout the startup ecosystem. Um, a few months ago, we partnered uh, with Bay Area Council to do some preliminary visualization of this research uh, in an interactive tool. Uh, we rolled it out with uh, Google at the political nominating conventions to a uh, very, very warm reception. And uh, it was a great success. We're really proud of the, the work we did in the engineering to make this type of research a little more accessible to the everyday person. Um, and ultimately, what we're driving at is that innovation and entrepreneurship are moving hand in hand. Uh, we had an event last month called Reroute SF that we co-sponsored along with Hattery um, that involves bringing in an SFMTA, talking about transit, transit problems, and bringing together technologists, uh, city planners, uh, transportation researchers, and others in the city to make transport more effective in uh, San Francisco. And these are the types of things where we think we can engage really effectively with individuals uh, in cities, at the, in the federal level, and at the state level. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ian Hathaway to talk about uh, the research that we are putting out today. Okay. Um, thanks, Ed. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to take a minute to thank Hattery for hosting this event and um, Engine Advocacy, who's, uh, without whose support this uh, research wouldn't have been possible, and of course, my colleagues at the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. Uh, this was a team effort. So kudos to, to uh, my colleagues. So um, <clears throat> this project was hatched, I guess, about six months ago, um, just playing around with some data in a spreadsheet. And it turned into what was a, <coughs> what I think is, a, is an important study on job creation in the United States today. Um, so we set out to, first of all, define high tech, um, to identify where high tech exists, um, and to quantify the importance of high tech to the economy. So I'll start out by explaining how we define high tech. Um, so using uh, you know, classifications that were defined by the federal government, we define high tech as the set of industries that has very high shares of STEM workers. These are workers in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. The threshold for that is, a, is five times the average across industries. So for example, if the average across industries is uh, you know, an industry has 5% STEM workers, you would need a minimum of 25% to make this list. So out of the 300 or so industries that um, are analyzed at this level of granularity, that yields 14 industries. Um, these industries coalesce around traditional high tech. Um, manufacturing and services in computers, communi advanced communications and electronics equipment, um, but also things like uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, aerospace, engineering services, and scientific research and development. So now that we've defined the universe of the high-tech sector, as we'll call it, we can make comparisons with jobs across um, the entire economy. So here we're looking at, we're comparing the, the percentage change in jobs in the high tech sector versus um, the total private sector over, um, over a few intervals here of time. Um, unfortunately, at this level of granularity, the data are only available through 2011. So, but I would suspect if we had data that were um, current through today, these trends would be even more pronounced. So, the bottom of the dot-com bust was reached in the beginning of 2004, and since then, you can see high-tech sector jobs have 
increased by 11%. Um, that amounts to about 612,000 jobs, um, which was 16% um, of all job growth across the entire across the entire economy during that period. Since the recession, um, of course, high tech is down, but not as much as jobs across the private sector. And in the recovery in the last year, high tech has added 156,000 jobs, which is 8% of all private sector job growth during that period. Um, here's the unemployment rate. So comparing high tech versus um, all workers, you know, as you can see, high tech workers are either less likely to be laid off, or if they are, they're more likely to find uh, jobs quickly. Um, only at the, in the midst of the dot-com bust did the unemployment rate for the high tech sector surpass the unemployment rate for the broader national unemployment rate. Um, and the next thing I want to focus on here is the distribution of high tech jobs around the country. So this map um, is showing you the concentration of high tech jobs by metro area in 1991. And actually, if I could have you flip back and forth. Um, so I'm not blocking the screen here. Here's what it looks like in 2011. So not only are these areas, you know, a good number of these areas getting darker, but it's also more widely dispersed. So if, Ed, would you flip back and forth between those? Um, which is pretty remarkable. Now in the report, we've also done this at the state level. Um, I've excluded it from this presentation uh, for the sake of brevity, but you know, you get the picture. Um, just to call out the top 25 metro areas for high tech concentration. Now, a lot of these are not going to be a surprise to you. Uh, the San Jose, um, Silicon Valley metro has almost 30%. Um, you know, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 20%. Seattle, 18%. But there are a few surprises in here. Um, I was surprised to see that Boulder, Colorado had 22% of its private sector workforce in high tech. Same with Huntsville, Alabama, which is a huge source of aerospace manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> now, what might be a little more surprising is the job growth that's occurring. Um, so whereas, you know, the concentration of high tech jobs is a little, has been a little more predictable, uh, recent job growth has not been. Now, we're seeing on the left panel here, we have uh, the percentage change in high tech job growth in the last year that the data is available, so in all of 2011. And for comparison, we do a five year growth rate. You can see that Greensboro, North Carolina increased its high tech jobs by 36% in 2011. Now, the first question that may jump out at you is to say, well, look, well, how many jobs does, you know, how many high-tech jobs does Greensboro, North Carolina have? And what does that really represent? It turns out that that represents 2,000 workers. So, you know, you could look at this and say, well, you know, it's because it's <coughs> a relatively low concentration, and it does. It's about 2.5% of their private sector workforce is in high-tech, um, whereas the national average is about 5.5%. Uh, five but still, 2,000 jobs, I would argue, that's, those, that's, those are a lot of jobs, and those are well-paying jobs. Um, to kind of fill this out, Columbia, South Carolina is also um, a below average concentration of high-tech jobs. Um, that was, they added 1,400. Dayton, Ohio, which happens to be my hometown, uh, added 3,500 jobs. And San Francisco, um, achieving 20% growth, that was on the back of 17,600 workers. So. Um, a lot of job growth going on in high tech in, in this region. Over the five year period, you see Boise, Idaho at the top, um, which 82%, 82.9% sounds like a lot, um, and it is from a very low base, but that constitutes uh, 5,800 workers. In Augusta, Richmond County, Georgia, South Carolina, that's another 2,000 workers. So, you know, in those last tables, we were just calling out a few of the names um, to describe, hey, look, here, here, is a, here are a few examples of where high-tech job growth is occurring the most. Um, but another way to do this is to show it statistically. So what these charts are, these are called scatterplot charts. And 
at the top here, we have, we have these for states and then for metros at the bottom. On the vertical axis here, we have the concentration of um, high-tech jobs. And then on the horizontal axis, we have percent change in job growth over a specified period of time, both over the one-year and the five-year horizon. So while you can see there is some correlation between these two measures, meaning that if <clears throat> the higher, the higher uh, job concentration you have in high-tech, the higher job growth there is in high-tech. But for three of these panels, it's not statistically significant. So that basically means that relationship is uh, essentially zero. Um, so, to me, that sort of nails down the point we're trying to make in the prior slides, that high-tech job growth is occurring in economically and geographically diverse areas um, within the last few years. Now, I want to switch over to STEM occupation employment, and the reason I want to do that is because, as I mentioned earlier, we are defining, defining the high-tech sector as the set of industries with very high shares of STEM workers. Um, and I want to take a minute to talk about the differences here. So with the high-tech sector, we're talking about industries. And those workers are organized around what does your company produce? What kind of goods and services do you produce? So that would include everything from the CEO to the secretary to software engineers of a high-tech firm. Now, STEM, STEM occupational employment is, you know, your when we're talking about occupational employment, we're organizing workers around the tasks they do. So, um, for example, about a little more than half of STEM workers um, are employed in industries outside of high tech. So, it's you could have software engineers in, you know, let's say, a law firm or in a high tech firm. So, we're going to just look at some trends in um, in STEM employment over the last decade. As you can see here, um, STEM has, with, with the exception of this drop during um, the period associated with the dot-com bus, STEM, STEM has grown at a pace that is um, far beyond um, total jobs, which of course are negative. During this period, STEM added 635,000 jobs for a growth rate of somewhere around 16%. I'm going to break it down a little bit for you here. Um, these are the components within STEM. So we have physical and life sciences, uh, computer and math sciences, and this category that we're calling engineering and related. So as you can see, physical and life sciences exploded uh, during this period. Uh, growth was explosive, um, adding 220,000 jobs. Computer and math sciences, which is much larger, um, added more than 500,000 jobs during this period. Now the engineering and related component fell, shedding 92,000 jobs during this period. What's interesting about this is that when you look within this segment, you see, you see uh, an interesting pattern that if you, if you break this down between engineers specifically across disciplines, so whether they're civil engineers, industrial engineers, electrical engineers, etc. Those jobs have been growing by about 16% over this period. It's this related segment, which are um, lower skilled, low to middle skilled workers in, um, that are in drafting, technician, and surveying professions. Those jobs fell by 23%. So one of the things you could say is going on within that segment is that the higher skilled jobs are increasing and the lower skilled jobs are, are declining by a significant amount. Um, again, unemployment rate here. Um, so STEM workers are either less likely to become unemployed, and if they are, they're more likely to find work than our workers across the economy. Consistently, you can see it's, it was dipping just below 2% throughout the late 90s, uh, a point at which it reached in 2007 as well. So next, uh, going to get into employment projections. Now, these are projections that are uh, calculated by the federal government at the Department of Labor. We're basically just applying our definitions of the high-tech industries and STEM occupations to estimate, based on those calculations, what 
the demand for these jobs will be in 2020. So this is not a forecast. It's to say if everything goes well for the next few years, hopefully it will, after what we just went through, um, this, is a, this is the increase in demand we would expect for these workers. So as you can see, the, high tech, the demand for high-tech workers um, is expected to outpace demand for workers in other sectors of the economy by a wide margin, I would argue. Looking at STEM occupations, same story, slightly less pronounced. Um, but one interesting note here, although, although we didn't include this in the study, the, the STEM, um, STEM job growth is going to be more and more uh, coming from the high-tech sectors. So you're going to expect to see less STEM job growth outside of high-tech and more STEM job growth within high-tech. Um, so now this is the part where we sort of get into the importance of these jobs. So I feel like we've kind of laid out a pretty good case so far that these jobs are everywhere, that they're growing at, um, at a robust pace. And, and I also want to argue that these, these are important jobs. So these are the average wage, average wages of these workers um, by industry grouping and occupation grouping, and also their five-year change. So I know this is a little bit noisy, um, but I just want to point out um, that high-tech workers, whether you're within the high-tech industry or you're a STEM worker inside or outside of high-tech, these are, these are well-paid workers. Now, that's probably not a big surprise, given that STEM workers require a significant amount of education, probably a bachelor's degree at a minimum, and that the high-tech industries are looking for highly skilled workers. But if you account for all these factors outside of industry or occupation that would affect someone's wages, such as their educational attainment, their age, their geographic location, their race, their citizenship status, marital status, etc. When you control for all these factors, there still exists a substantial wage premium. So what this would indicate is that um, a worker in high tech could expect to earn on average 17% more than a comparable worker in an industry outside of high tech. That's amazing. Um, for STEM occupations, that's more pronounced, and at 21%. And for a STEM worker within high tech, you could expect to earn uh, more than 27% more than an identical worker in a different occupation or a different industry. So the, you know, the important part about wages that I want to discuss, maybe before we flip into that, is that you know, this reflects this is partially, partially reflective of the fact that high tech is growing. You know, it's generating a lot of income. And income gains are shared by shareholders and workers, as well as, as, well as governments in the form of taxation. So this is reflective of the economic growth in these industries and also the demand for technical workers. So this leads me to my last point here, um, which is, what, is the, what are the secondary effects of jobs in high tech? So if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I want to give you a little background on this. So if you divide the economy into two segments, let's call segment one the tradable segment. Uh, the tradable segment makes, uh, produces goods and services that can be bought or sold around the world. So you think about manufactured goods. Um, they, can be, they can be bought or sold anywhere. Internet searches can be conducted um, from, from anywhere with, a, with access to the web. So the tradable segment um, is where, where the substantial majority of productivity growth and innovation are coming from. They have access to a global marketplace. So they're capturing this, this income from around the world and bringing it home to places like where we are right now. Um, some of the earlier research I've done shows that the tradable segment 
um, over the last two decades is responsible for um, a rough measure would be 95, uh, I'm, let me rephrase that, uh, productivity growth in the tradable segment has grown 95% over that two decade period. In the rest of the economy, it grew 15%. So this is a really important segment um, for our economy. Now, high tech is very emblematic of the tradable sector. Um, it's one of the fastest growing in terms of economic output, and of course, it's the, you know arguably the driver of innovation and productivity. Somewhere around 60% of all R&D comes from the high tech sector. For comparison, it's about five and a half percent of employment and three and a half percent of of all business establishments. So that's amazing. It's a very outsized share. So now let me get to the non-tradable segment of the economy. That is basically, uh, if you think of all the local services, someone who cooks you a meal, um, gives you, checks you in at your hotel, drives you around in a taxi, um, also maybe your physician. These kind of jobs are, you know, basically shielded from international competition um, and, and, and competition from other places around the country. And therefore, wages, uh, excuse me, productivity and innovation are low. Now, all of that income that's being generated by this innovative high-tech sector is supporting local jobs through what we'll call a multiplier effect. So a big part of this has to do with the fact that high-tech workers earn a lot. Um, that money can be spent on a number of the services I just described. Um, but also because the high-tech high -tech companies tend to cluster around one another, that supports local businesses that are involved um, <coughs> with the normal business operations of high tech. Now the reason we do this for manufacturing, uh, we do a similar multiplier for manufacturing, is because you know, we want to draw this contrast. I think regional economic development has often focused on bringing manufacturing jobs uh, you know, to, their, to different regions. Um, but we would argue that high tech, uh, is three, the, the multiplier effect for high tech is three times as large, um, which is pretty remarkable. So um, to kind of sum everything up, um, job growth has been more robust in the recent past in high tech uh, versus the private sector at large. High tech employment is increasingly dispersing around the country, and um, you know not only into uh, it's not only spreading geographically, but I, I think the economic composition, the economic characteristics of some of these regions are also very different. Um, the same is true of STEM occupations. It's been growing. Those those jobs have been growing more so than uh, total occupations. Employment projections indicate that uh, these trends will continue. Unemployment in high tech and STEM have been very low, and uh, wage growth has been strong. Um, when we account for factors outside of industry and occupation that affect wages, high tech and STEM workers earn a substantial wage premium. And finally, this local multiplier for high tech is very large. Um, and with that, I guess we could kick off our discussion. Thank you.